We have two scripture readings today, one from the Old Testament and one from the New Testament. The Old Testament reading is from Numbers 21, verses 4 through 9. The New Testament reading is John 3, verses 14 through 21. So let's hear the Numbers one first. Numbers 21, beginning with verse 4. From Mount Hor they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, but the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it on a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. John three fourteen through 21. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So there's a lot of parallels between those two passages and just as the Israelites could look at the serpent God instructed Moses to lift up in the wilderness and live, if we lift up our eyes to focus on Jesus and the cross, we can live eternally. If we admit we need help, we need a savior, the help is there. Then we'll be able to focus on divine things rather than things of the world. We will be better able to discern God's will for us. We will interpret scripture with the aid of the Holy Spirit and in the light of Jesus Christ. By faith, we can do these things and go on to eternal life. We can really live out our purpose here on earth and then go on to live with him forever in heaven. Our New Testament passage doesn't really make sense without the background story from our Old Testament passage. The Israelites in the desert, still wandering, became impatient. And I think they were a bit of complainers too, because did you catch that? It said they, there was no food, there is no food, and then we hate this food. But anyway, it was hard. It was hard to survive in a land without plentiful food and water. So when they complained against God and against Moses, the serpents appeared, biting the people and killing them. Then the Israelites repent and God tells Moses to make a serpent and set it on a pole so that anyone who had been bitten might look at it and live. The serpent then, which had been a mark of God's anger, became a mark of God's mercy. To see the Son of Man, Jesus Christ lifted up, as our John passage tells us, 
calls for belief for the sake of eternal life, not simply a restoration of earthly life. As one commentator puts it, God once saved the people by calling upon them to gaze on the serpent. Now God would save the people by having them gaze in belief upon the sun lifted up. How can we, how can we keep our eyes on the cross and maintain constant contact with God? Well, by focusing on divine priorities, interpreting scripture and the light of Jesus Christ, discerning with the aid of the Holy Spirit, and through faith. This will lead us towards gaining eternal life. So first, we need to maintain conscious contact with God. And God is always with us. We know this because he has promised us that. In Isaiah 41, he says, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. And we know, like it says in Proverbs, that if we commit our work to the Lord, our plans will be established. After all, we are called according to his purpose. Paul writes to the Romans that we know that all things work together for good, for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. And we're able to keep conscious contact through, with God through prayer and through meditation and through reading scripture. And a big part of that is paying attention and listening for what God is saying to you. We also maintain contact by just admitting that we need help and lifting up our eyes to find it in God and Christ Jesus. As Psalm 121 says, I lift up my eyes to the hills from where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. And I really like the rendition of this psalm in song form by the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. So look that up if you get a chance. But secondly, we need to focus on divine priorities. When we lift up our eyes, we set our minds on divine priorities or things above, as Colossians 3.2 tells us, to set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. But what are these things? Well, Philippians tells us they are things like whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable. If there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Next, we need to discern with the aid of the Holy Spirit. If we don't conform to the world, it's easier to understand the will of God. Romans 12 tells us not to be conformed to the world, but to be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And one way to help discern God's will is to simply ask God. James 1.5 says, If any of you is lacking in wisdom, ask God, who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given you. Sometimes the answer may not appear to be so clear-cut, though. And we can use a tool referred to as the Wesleyan Quadrilateral. As Methodists, we have this tool based on the theology of Wesley and developed by Albert Outler and others that we look at a problem or a situation through four different lenses, through scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. And when we look at it through all four of those ways, we can more readily discern what God's will is for us in that situation. We also have to be careful to interpret scripture in the light of Jesus Christ. We know that all scripture is inspired by God, as it says in 2 Timothy, and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. But we also need to look at how Jesus taught the Hebrew Bible, and how Jesus himself presented the scriptures. According to Richard, Father Richard Rohr, Jesus consistently ignored or even denied exclusionary, punitive, 
and tri uh, triumphalistic texts in his own inspired Hebrew Bible in favor of passages that emphasized inclusion, mercy, and honesty. So he read the scriptures in a much more spiritual way rather than a legalistic way. And we are to do the same. But all this we do through faith which, as Hebrews 11 tells us, is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. We keep our faith by looking to Jesus and following the examples of those matriarchs and patriarchs of our church who came before us. Hebrews 12 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. And so we're to look to this cloud of witnesses. There are many Christians who walked the path before us and served as good examples, but ultimately we're to look to Jesus Christ and we're to try to make it so that people see Jesus when they look at us. As Paul said, it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. We live in, in, in the life I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We live by faith in the God who loved us so much that he gave his Son so that we might have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It just rolls off the tongue in the King James Version, because that's how I learned it. But it's, it's true in any version, in any translation. Um, God loved the world so much that he gave his only Son. And the Numbers passage, the snake was to save the Israelites. But in the John passage, Jesus Christ is there to save anyone who will believe in him. Jesus was telling the disciples about the mission he was undertaking, but they didn't really get it. When he says the Son of Man must be lifted up, he met himself and on the cross. But the disciples didn't really realize it at the time, and sometimes we don't realize that we can't do it all on our own. It's about surrendering ourselves to what will save us, surrendering ourselves to God instead of thinking that we can do it if we just keep trying and plugging away at it. We have to admit that we are human and we're fallible and there's poison in our system that will kill us, as one commentator says, if we don't do something radical, something desperate. One of my Facebook friends posted last night that we all need other people. And that's true. Uh, and he said that people who are super independent were likely let down or failed by someone so they don't trust easily. But God, will never let us down. The blood of Jesus will never fail us. The good news is that all we need to do is look, look up to the cross and believe. All we need to do to receive God's healing grace is to lift up our eyes and see Jesus, see our Savior. All we need to do is trust that he is the one who can transform us, change us, restore us, heal us, save us, and then let him keep doing it. Let us pray. Dear God, we are still in the wilderness. We are learning the way and getting better at following. So now we're even more aware of how much more we have to learn and how much farther we have to travel to keep up with where Jesus leads. And so we pray, forgive us when we go astray and keep us on the pathway that you have set for us. Keep us on your pathway. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.